Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. Today we're speaking with Jenny Drumgool. We're at her house in the Kensington, East Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia. We've known about Jenny's work, her subversive videos, for a number of years. She creates a persona, sort of a parody superwoman. In her food videos, she inserts herself into national or local contests, like the Philadelphia Wing Bowl, for example, or the Paula Dean Real Women of Philadelphia Recipe Contest. But it's not about winning for Jenny. It's about exposing something, usually something seedy, about the corporate contest or about society. One of the captivating things about your Real Women of Philadelphia videos is your interweaving of the movie hero or anti-hero, Rambo, with your lady in the kitchen cooking. So can you explain to us how you came up with the idea of the twin conceits of Rambo and cooking? Sure. Um, I have been fascinated with John Rambo as a sort of archetype for years. Um, when the cream cheese contest started, there were a couple of rules that, that you had in terms of making the videos, that they could only be 10 minutes long, that you couldn't use any music, and you couldn't have another person in the video, which is sort of the opposite of how I work. I work with other people, I use lots of music, and you know they are sometimes longer than 10 minutes. So I figured, well, if I have a fake person, I can, if someone just sort of um, converse with through the whole thing, then that would, that would be fine. And um, the contest was only for women. Really? I, yes, only women could enter the contest. And um, I thought it would be interesting to insert the manliest of manly characters into this lady contest and sort of see what happens. Did anybody comment to you, any of the other contestants, about Rambo? Or anybody say anything about him? Y yeah. You know, in the comments, you can see, if you go to, the videos are still up on the cream cheese website. You know, there were some where Rambo is featured more prominently than others. Um, you know, when I made the Rambo cheese head mold, lots of people, you know, were commenting about Rambo. And then in the third one, um, where I have a sort of nervous breakdown and I cook everything in the bathroom, but the John Rambo poster brings me back. Um, I'm delivering the lines from Rambo. It's sort of uh, verbatim what he delivers at the end of uh, Rambo, the first Rambo. There were some Rambo fans in the contest. So here's a really off-the-wall question. When did you learn to cook? Um, my mom is an awesome cook. And, um, you know, I don't really do a lot of cooking. But whenever we have a party, I get really into sort of hosting. So then, you know, I come up with, I have really good barbecue recipes and I know how to cook a turkey really well, even though I'm a vegetarian, but um, I cover it in bacon and all that sort of stuff. But like I said, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a cook. Tell us how long it takes you to make a video. For example, Husky is like a 20 minute long mm -hmm. video and it's got incredible appropriation from other source material that you're interweaving animation and clips of yourself and clones of yourself all over the place. So how long does it take to make Husky, let's say? I want to say Husky took maybe six months to make. And there are tons and tons of other footage and scenarios that I didn't use. Um, whereas something like the, uh, the cream cheese recipe videos you know, they were due every Sunday. And so I had a week to make those. And, you know, I was teaching during the week and I gave myself like Thursday and Friday to sort of come up with con some kind of idea and then start shooting and then be have to be finished shooting by Saturday and then start editing to get them up by Sunday. So um, it was a kind of a crazy schedule, but I, I, I liked having to do something just on the fly and going with your first kind of instinct rather than overthinking it to where you, know, you can't finish something. But the, um, the final video in the Cream Cheese Project, that's about 35 minutes. And that took me months. That took months. And it was, you know, um, sort of calling through all of the footage that was shot in Savannah where I, you know, I had to make sense of kind of how to piece together the story to someone who has no idea what's going on with this sort of absurd contest. When we went to Delaware, just waiting for that sort of stuff to happen. Can you so, explain a little bit why you're in Savannah, why you're in Delaware? 
Right. Um, so the cream cheese contest was something that my mom convinced me to do. And I started it as a full on joke for her because uh, she kept sending me these uh, Facebook little notifications about Paula Dean hosting this cream cheese contest. And then the winner was going to get to meet Paula Dean in Savannah. And she kept sending them and sending them. And like I said, I don't cook, but she, all she knew, my mom was like, well, you can make videos. And I was like, mom, these aren't the, like the videos that I make aren't the recipe videos that they're going to want. Um, so like I said, they were due on a Sunday. So I decided on that Saturday morning, I was just going to make one as a joke. And I called my mom and I was like, mom, I did it. So after I uploaded the first one, um, you know, I was doing these videos and I fully thought I was going to get kicked off because the recipes were ridiculous. So um, the website was set up like a Facebook page. So I was like, well, if I have lots of friends, they won't kick me off. So I just friended everyone I could find. But then the second week, Paula Dean, quote unquote, comes on and she would feature, she would talk about maybe three or four recipes during the week and give a little shout out. And my Rambo cream cheese head talking mold she said something like, I don't know what's going on in this video, but it had me howling all the way down in Savannah. And um, once I got that, I, I made so many friends on that site. My mom was so proud, <laughs> proudest ever. <laughs> and I called her and I was like, look at the website. And she basically hangs up on me and starts putting it on Facebook. After I go through all of this, and there were a couple other times that Paula Dean mentioned my videos. So when it comes time to announce the finalists, which I couldn't, I couldn't be a finalist in this because I never really cooked anything, I decided I was going to go down to Savannah. And I, um, my friend came with me and she filmed me. And from the beginning, my goal was to get my mom's cookbook signed by Paula Dean. And I say it through a, like a bunch of them. It's like, please sign my mom's cookbooks. And I was like, hell or high water, I'm doing what I have to do to get the cookbook signed. So that's why I went to Savannah. And how about Delaware? Well, Savannah was sort of a nightmare. And, um, you know, I met uh, the women who were great. It was great seeing them. But I also met the producers um, where I found out, you know, it's not Paula Dean who's doing this. And, you know, you they were commenting on the website. Right, right, of course. And I was like, wow, I, I sort of feel like an idiot. I, I'm a pretty tech savvy person. But I guess I didn't realize that you know, how actually big Paula Dean is and she's got people doing this and she's uh, sponsored or um, endorses so many other things. And um, so I came back and I spent all this money to go down there. I was like, no, I'm, I, I'm good. It's done, not over yet. I didn't get it signed. So it was about a month later, I saw online that Paula Dean was going to be at the Delaware, um, what is the Delaware, some sort of Delaware casino and doing a book signing. And it was $100 a ticket, and I got a ticket for my mom and I, and I'm like, Mom, we're going. And uh, so that's why we went there, to where she, um, I would have to see her face-to-face. -face. So listening to this story... It's, it's an epic cream <laughs> cheese. <laughs> exactly. It is epic. It's, it's epic, but the story, the nut of the story, is this mother-daughter yes. bonding thing yes. going on. But if you actually look at the videos, other than the moments where you actually do deal with the mother-daughter bonding thing, it's out of control. It's no longer, oh, I'm such a good girl. It's, I'm the worst person <laughs> possible. <laughs> well, no, I'm just a little, um, yeah, I'm just sort of a mess. I'm a good person in those videos. I'm just, a, I don't know, just a, just a mess. And then there's the persona in Husky where you practically become an animal. All of those characters are really me. You know, I am a big dorky spaz that's really awkward. And so I'm just taking it to the nth degree. And um, I always say I have like uh, two speeds. It's like zero or 10. You know, with the Husky character, it's the kind of the ego version of me feeling, you know, questioning what I should be doing. And then my raging id, who's doing what I want to do. And then the new project I'm working on, um, I call her Socks. She's very much the me that I was when I was, say, 11 or 12 years old, 
when I was one of those girls who got the height I am now by the time I was like 10 and it was the 80s. So the monstrosity that was like my hair. I mean, hair was hair has been super important to me ever since I could hold like a curling iron. It was just a mess. And I was, even then I was super obsessed with bands and I covered my entire room with new kids on the block and to where it's sort of scary. That character is just sort of me then when I'm not caring about anything and just going through without sort of any feeling like I'm supposed to be doing anything. But there's a total joyfulness to her. And then just also not knowing how things should be and then going through the world and then figuring them out. So when did you decide you were an artist? Were you an artist when you were a child? You thought thoughts like an artist thinks? And No. No, I mean, I was making stuff. I would make videos that my mom has um, when I was a kid. But when I was in college, I took a photo class as an elective. And that's when I started, um, you know, sort of seriously thinking about doing this. So, and I started making videos because I was working on a photo project that was failing miserably. Um, I was actually photographing Sonia Thomas. Who's that? The uh, wing bowl, the woman in wing bowl. Oh, right. And um, it was just, I couldn't get what I wanted in the pictures. And then... Um, what were you going for? I wasn't quite sure. I just loved who, that she was this little woman who was going into these eating contests and just like tearing them up. I actually found out about her before I went to grad school, and it was the first year that she won Wing Bowl. I didn't go, but I was reading, there was an Inquirer story about this woman who came in, and the, um, I think she might have been one of the first women to ever enter, let alone win and the contest. Say what the contest is. Oh, yeah. Wing Bowl, for those of you who don't know, is a yearly eating contest that's sponsored by the local sports radio station, and it's always held Thursday before the Super Bowl. It starts, oh, God awful early in the morning. It's something like 7 a.m. It's a uh, chicken wing eating contest, and they have the wingettes um, who are basically uh, wearing nothing and are there as the sort of eye candy. What happens is, because the contest is so early, people start tailgating the night before. So you've got all of these um, Eagle fans who've been in the parking lot drinking for hours and hours and hours and knowing that they're gonna see women who will are like flashing them. Um, so it's not, it's not a place that a lot of women wanna go. <laughs> Just because if you're there, um, people are gonna be yelling at you, show your tits, show your tits. And um, they're, like I said, they're drunk. And, and so Sonia Thomas, Explain what she did that makes her so captivating to you. Yeah, um, in Wing Bowl 12, she won the contest. And, the um, eating contest. The eating contest, yes. She won the eating contest. The one that I participated in was Wing Bowl 13, which was the following year where she was coming back to defend her title. So, Did you actually eat? You were a contestant? No, I was her wingette. And what appalled you about this? I mean, clearly this is sort of, I mean... Uh, on one hand, it sounds like you thought it was wonderful, and on the other hand, right. you thought well, it was horrible. Yeah, I'm always... Um, um, the work that I make has a lot to do with these um, absurdist kind of spectacle, spectacles that I both love and hate at the same time. You know, going in... I mean, it's sort of scary going into Wing Bowl. The thing that was the, the hardest is when, you know, we do a procession around the stadium, and everyone was upset that Sonia won the year before. So this was going to be the year that El Wingador was coming back and he was taking that title back. So during this procession, as soon as we start going out, people started throwing, um, they had glass beer bottles full that they were throwing at us. And they, they should have stopped it going around, but we, you know, we did the whole procession. I was like soaking wet by the time that um, we made it to the stage. And what were and she you was wearing? Shaking. I was wearing a unitard. I figured that would be the most appropriate sort of winget costume, would be a leopard unitard. And then, you know, just a lot of people who were screaming and yelling at you. Um, you know, when we're walking in, I had to, they were, I was told to go through a separate entrance, like the wingette entrance, which I couldn't find. It's a crazy mob. And um, so I'm trying to push through the crowds. And as soon as they see a woman who, who looks like she's sort of wingette 
material. You know, the whole crowd started, and this is in the video, they started um, chanting, show your tits, show your tits, show your tits. Yeah, so I mean, it's a kind of a crazy scene. It was kind of a crazy scene. So, what's... But I would go back. <laughs> you would? Yes. As, a, as a, an entrant or a wing yes? See, okay, I'm a vegetarian. And I, I, before I decided to be a wingette, I um, was like, well, I'll give up being a veg. And I've been a vegetarian since I was maybe 14. And I was like, well, it, if I could do this, I would, I'll stop being a vegetarian. So that's why in the video, there's footage of me eating a pie. But trying to eat that fast is really, really, really hard. So I'm like, well, if I can't even get through a pie in like 30 minutes, there's no way. There's no way I could do this. So... So you're sort of like a movie star in your own movies, and, you know, taking on... I, it's only because no one else will do it. <laughs> it would be nice if I, no one else will do it. <laughs> well, how could you get someone else to do it? Because there's a certain zaniness that goes on that seems to just grow out of you. I always think I could, like, if I lived closer to my mom, she could do it. Because my mom is, I mean, you think I'm crazy. Is my she mom. a performer? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, she is. Mm -hmm. Is that in your future to make a video with mom, you think? I actually, at one point, and I never really did anything it, with it, but um, I made a video about my immediate family and just that experience of being home and how just funny and ridiculous it is. How okay. many siblings do you have? I have one brother and one sister. So. And where are you in the mix? I'm a middle child. Uh huh. <laughs> that explains it all. I know. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've been oh, talking you, with Jenny Drumgoul today. Thank you, Jenny. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.